Well, good morning. Last week, we saw that the picture of the Father we all carry in our hearts, who we believe him to be, is the very foundation, the root from which our lives grow. When that picture is wrong, someone can think of themselves as a passionate believer in God, and yet in truth, not know the heart of the Father at all. Believing in God, and yet not knowing him is a big problem. This is why we have been given the Holy Spirit. He is the one who can reveal the mind of God to men and women, so that we may know him. And there is nothing greater than knowing God. The Apostle Paul said that he counted everything else as loss compared to knowing Christ Jesus. The Holy Spirit is given because God wants us to know him. In fact, Jesus defined eternal life in terms of knowing him and the Father. In his prayer recorded in John 17, Jesus made this statement to the Father. This is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Now, in Ireland, with uh, even all the social changes that have taken place in recent years and the falling away from traditional religious observance, still I would think that most people, if you asked them, do you believe in God, would still answer yes. And what people commonly mean by that is that they believe in his existence. But as we saw last week, if you ask them, do you know him, they tend to go a bit quiet. You see, we were brought up to talk about believing in God, but we never really talked about knowing him. Here is something else that causes folk to go a little bit quiet, I think, for the same reason. Have you ever noticed that you can be at a social gathering of friends, and if the subject of God comes up, people will be pretty free about their opinion. But if you mention the name of Jesus and start to talk about him, it quickly gets a lot quieter. You know, it's sad that on an average Saturday night in Ireland, the name of Jesus will be used by hundreds of thousands of people, but not because they want to talk about him. I dare say the majority of those people would say they believe in God, but they can't know him, because anyone who knows God would never use the name of Jesus in that way. In fact, the Apostle Paul told the Corinthians that no one speaking by the Spirit of God would curse Jesus, because when you have the Holy Spirit, you know Jesus. And when you know him, all you can say is, Jesus is Lord. People use the word believe, you know, all the time and in many different situations in life. Some people believe in a political ideology. Others claim passionately to believe in their favorite football team. You can even believe in your grandmother's recipe for ivory stew. I'm gonna show you today that everyone you know believes in something and someone. But when the New Testament talks about believing unto salvation, it is not speaking about a belief you come to by yourself after weighing up all the facts. Belief in Jesus Christ as the true picture of the Father is never something you can do by yourself because our minds cannot take in the true nature of God without God revealing himself to us. This is why the Apostle Paul wrote that no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. In other words, to truly believe in God as he really is, we need his own spirit to reveal to us who he really is. The gospel, the news, the announcement of what God has done for us, Christ and him crucified, is the light the Holy Spirit uses to open our eyes to see and know God as he really is. So this morning, we're gonna see that there is a natural believing, which everyone is able to do, and there is a supernatural believing, which no one can do apart from God's Spirit. This believing by the Spirit brings a true transformation into our lives from the inside out because we were made to know God. I think I need to say that again for some folk watching this video. You were made to know God. You were made for eternal life and that is exactly why none of the stuff you have bought, none of the holidays you have taken, and none of the ambitions you have achieved have ever brought or ever will bring peace to your life because you were made to know him. I said earlier that someone can think of themselves as a passionate believer in God and yet in truth not know the heart of the Father at all. Let's go back to one such zealous believer in God, Saul of Tarsus on his way to Damascus. He believes he's on his way to bring God's judgment onto the Christians there. He is fresh from overseeing the killing of Stephen in Jerusalem, and he's quite prepared to do the same again. Now, how do you change such a man? 
to make him more Christ-like. How can a person be transformed from believing in his own picture of God to actually knowing God? Well, we need to recognize that a man's actions are, are just the branches in his life. The root of his behavior is what he is believing. It's not good enough to just deal with the branches if you haven't dealt with the root. Listen to Proverbs 4.23. Keep vigilant watch over your heart. That's where life starts. Now the word heart there refers to your core beliefs. Let's think about the root, the beliefs of Saul's heart, or to use the language from our computer age, his software, the operating system that's running him. The opening verses of Acts 9 describe Saul going to the high priest in Jerusalem and asking for a written authority that would enable him to go to Damascus and arrest Christians. And verse 1 gives us a powerful description of what was filling Saul's heart at that time. It says this, Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. Now when you look up the original Greek word that is translated breathing out or breathing, it is the word empneo, and it actually means to inhale, to breathe in. Saul was only breathing out what he was breathing in. The spirit, the belief that was feeding him, driving him, animating him. Now that's the same for all people. Your life right now is the physical manifestation of what you are believing, what you have been breathing in. Now to a certain extent you can trim back or cover up some behavior you're not proud of, but there is no man-made tool that is sharp enough to trim behavior right back to its root, because the root of your life is the spirit, the belief that you are breathing in. Now you could say that in this life there are two spirits we can be breathing in, the spirit of the world or the spirit that comes from God. The spirit of the world is the belief that all there is to life is what my natural senses tell me there is. And my natural senses, what I'm seeing and hearing and feeling, is that God doesn't appear to have given me anything. So I am left believing in myself. But listen to what the Apostle Paul writes about these two spirits in 1 Corinthians 2, 11 and 12. The thoughts of God no one knows except the Spirit of God. Now we have received not the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, so that we may know the things freely given to us by God. So we're talking this morning about believing being like breathing in, and there are two spirits or breaths we can breathe in. The breath of this world, which leaves you believing in yourself because you feel you have been left in this world by yourself, or the breath of God, His Spirit, which leaves you believing that He is with you, and so you don't have to save yourself. You know, all the time you have been listening to this message, you have been breathing, but you were not consciously doing it. You were not having to take a decision for each breath. Your lungs breathe because they can't help it. Your heart believes for the same reason. It can't help it. It cannot do otherwise because you were made for believing. Do you know that means that there's no such thing as an unbeliever in the sense of someone who believes nothing? We were all made, created to believe because we were made for the truth for him who is, that we may believe in him who is. So have our lives formed by him in whom we believe, he who is the truth about everything. Let me say that in a different way. We were made to breathe in the breath of God, to inhale what God knows, so that what God knows becomes what we know, and that knowing his life in us becomes our lives. And we go into this world breathing out his life into this world, for we can all only breathe out what we have breathed in. In Genesis, we see a picture. We see God breathing his breath into Adam, but later, Adam breathed in the lie of Satan, that I can find life apart from God. And in breathing that in, that apart from God life became his life. But after his resurrection, Jesus appeared to his disciples and the apostle John says he did a remarkable thing. Jesus breathed on his disciples and said, receive the Holy Spirit, the pneuma, the breath of God. To go back to our computer language, we could say he was rebooting their software. He was installing in them a download of the knowledge of God so that they would know what God knows and begin to breathe that out. 
Why? So that they could go out into the world and breathe out the breath of God, the knowledge of God into people. In fact, John says that just before Jesus breathed on his disciples, he said these words, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And immediately he breathed on them. He was literally breathing into them peace. Now, what does that mean? Well, the Greek word translated there as peace is irene. It literally means to set at one again. To breathe in the knowledge of what God knows about us is to be restored to the life God always intended for us, a life of being at one with him, of living knowing that no matter what happens to you, nothing can now separate you from him. What that knowing imparts into someone's life is such a security, such a peace, that they no longer feel they have to save themselves. This breath of God, his spirit in us, testifies with our spirit, convinces us, persuades us, comforts us that we are indeed the children of God. And in being filled with this breath, this knowing of him, we become like him. We become the person he always purposed and graced us to be in him, in Christ. A person set at one with him, a person partaking of his divine union. We begin to live no longer as an I, but as an us. Now you might be thinking, Phelan, I'm not sure I understand what that looks like or even what that feels like. Here's a very simple picture. When we were all babies, there were times when we just cried our hearts out and there was only one thing that would stop that cry, being picked up by our mother or father and being held firmly but gently over their heart so that once again we felt that we were one with them and not separated from them. I need to tell you this morning, no matter what age you are, that you were made to be held that way by God. And no matter how many times or how hard you embrace this world and all its pleasures, this world will never silence the cry in your heart for the peace of God, the experience of being set at one with Him that only the reception of His Holy Spirit brings. This world cannot embrace you in the way that Christ did on the cross, an embrace that imparted to you by his spirit, the comforter. Some people look at the turmoil and the strife and the division in the world and they say, why can't God bring peace to this world? He already did. 2000 years ago, he breathed his peace into his disciples. And in effect, this is what he said to them. As the father has sent me, so I also send you. Go and impart to people what I know about them, my mind in them, the good news that I am not holding their sins against them, but in fact have reconciled them to myself. The good news that when my arms were outstretched on the cross, it was to embrace them. For as you breathe out on them the truth of my Father's heart for them, they will experience me taking hold of them, embracing them to myself, and then they too can live the lives of people set at one with God. But if you don't tell them what I know about them, if you don't preach the gospel, if you don't breathe my breath in them, then they will remain only breathing in the breath of Adam, what he believed in, the apart from God life. So we're talking this morning about believing. And I am saying that the believing the Holy Spirit brings about is an in-breathing, a knowing of, a personal experience of the love, the embrace of the Father. I said earlier that there's nothing and no one in this world that you can embrace or that can embrace you that will bring peace into your life, the experience of being set at one that only being embraced by God brings. When the Holy Spirit ministers this peace to us, Paul gives an interesting description of the response of our hearts. He says, we cry, Abba, Daddy. I think that points to a fundamental need we all carry within us. And it is not to know a book or a doctrine, but to know a person. The Apostle Paul did not write, I know what I have believed. He wrote, I know whom I have believed. At the root of Paul's life was a truth he believed in. And that truth wasn't a philosophy or a religion, but a person who is Christ. When you think about it, as children, the most uh, fundamental, the first truth we believed in were not intellectual propositions or philosophies or religious doctrine, but people our parents, 
their presence in our lives, the way they were with us, imparted to us the truth that we believed about our own worth and identity that formed us into the people we became and informed all our decisions and actions. I dare say that there are many of us who would claim to believe much great doctrine, yet you know, find that even after all these years, our hearts still more operate by what we breathed in during our formative years as children, the way people were with us and what that imparted to us about our worth. It's amazing how much damage to the gospel has been done by insecure preachers who had a distant relationship with their own authoritarian fathers and now in part breathe out that cold, distant spirit into the lives of their congregations. A highly intelligent man or woman may live all their lives feeling stupid because of an encounter imprinted in their hearts with their father or mother who called them stupid, who breathed over them and they believed it. Our hearts were made for believing and they continually believe, just as our lungs continually breathe. You know, the writer G.K. Chesterton once famously said, when a man stops believing in God, he doesn't start believing in nothing, he starts believing in anything. And it's so true. You just look at what happens when someone refuses to believe that God created the universe. They believe almost anything else, no matter how far-fetched. One of the most famous scientists in history who discovered DNA knew it was simply impossible for life to have emerged on earth unaided. And so, you know, he finished up his days believing that the only explanation must be that aliens brought life to earth. There is no one who believes nothing. If you're not a believer in Christ, in God's view of what is true, the reason for that is not that you do not believe in anything, but rather that you have already believed in something else or someone else. You're only breathing out what has been breathed into you by someone else. So we're saying this morning that there is no such thing as an unbeliever in the sense of someone who believes nothing. By the age of seven, every person already has a basic theology, a belief about God, his existence or otherwise, which has been formed by their encounters with others, primarily their parents and the world around them that is breathed over them. Everyone is believing something about what is about what their natural senses are telling them is. Our whole lives are rooted in what we believe is true. And in fact, Proverbs 4.23 tells us that these beliefs, what our hearts are believing, borders our lives. None of us can live beyond the borders of what we have believed. So if you want to live a different life, don't look to that new car or new house or new job or new partner to deal with the fears or anxieties that rule your life. What you need is a new heart, new truth to live by. And the only truth that history shows, imparts, breathes into people, the most beautiful, generous, fearless, selfless life is an encounter with the truth who is Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit is the one who ministers such encounters. The Lord's answer to Saul of Tarsus on his way to Damascus, breathing in and breathing out hate, wasn't to give him a book he already had the right book. He was just reading it with the wrong belief in his heart, the wrong picture of the Father. He didn't need another book. He needed an encounter with the author of the book, Jesus. No one comes to the Father as the Father truly is without an encounter with Jesus, who is the Father as he truly is. For as Jesus declared to Philip, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. The encounter with Christ that breathes into someone that births into their heart the truth of who God the Father is from which grows the life of Christ can only happen by the breath of God, His Holy Spirit. Remember we said in previous weeks that the Holy Spirit is the one who enables us to believe by testifying to our hearts that we are God's children. He is described as pouring into our hearts the love of God, a love that convinces us we are God's children and causes us to cry out to God, to look to Him as our Abba, literally our daddy. That's why the New Testament describes salvation as the gift of God, not something that can be achieved by any amount of religious works so that no man can boast. The grace of God that saves us is his very spirit, his very breath. Men are not saved by a book, but by an encounter with Christ breathed into them by the Holy Spirit. Now like Saul, every person can only breathe out what they have breathed in. 
If people are birthed into a new belief by an encounter with the breath of God's Spirit, can you see how important it is that they meet people who are breathing out God's Spirit? No wonder then that Paul told the Ephesians to be being filled with the Holy Spirit. Believer, keep breathing in the breath of God. Keep the focus of your life, the enormity of who Christ is and what he has done for you. Let your heart, your believing, abide, remain there, and you shall bear much fruit, just as a tree bears much fruit when its roots are by a stream, a constant source of life. What does it look like for a Christian to be breathing in the breath of God? I think it looks like someone who has not lost their first love, but is living overwhelmed by the grace of God, living in a constant state of awareness of His grace and mercy lavished on them, for they are aware of His presence with them. What could be greater than that? It looks like someone knowing that God has taken hold of them and is not letting go of them. And that experience brings such a peace to the human soul, a peace that draws us out of self-consciousness and into God consciousness. You know, the Bible has a name for that lack of self-consciousness in someone. It is called boldness. And it is said that the religious authorities who tried to intimidate the early church into staying silent about Jesus were amazed at the boldness of these fishermen from Galilee who had no formal education. And they took note that they had been with Jesus. Well, what they didn't realize is that the source of that great boldness and courage in the disciples was not just that they had been with Jesus, but that those disciples knew by the inbreathing of the Holy Spirit that Jesus was still with them, for they knew by the Spirit that they had been set at one with him. They carried what he had breathed into them, his irene, his peace, and the effect of that was a supernatural knowing that wherever they went, he went. That's why Paul and Silas could rejoice while being chained in a dungeon, because they were in the presence of the Lord. And where the presence of God is, there is fullness of joy. I believe the Holy Spirit wants the church of this generation to inbreathe the revelation of their union with Christ in such a way that emboldens us with a peace and a joy and a passion that we have not walked in up to now. Let me say that in a different way. In this season we're in, Everything that has kept us so busy for so long has been brought to a stop. God is not the one who has come to kill, steal and destroy lives. He is the restorer of lives, the one who turns to the good for the church what the enemy meant for our destruction. So what is he saying to the church across the world right now? Are you ready for this? Then let all those who have ears to hear, hear what the Spirit is saying to the church at this moment in history, when all our doing has been brought to a stop. Church, catch your breath. Now that you have stopped, catch your breath. And the breath I made you to catch and to carry is my breath, what I know. For to breathe in what I know is to know that I have set you at one with me. It is to know peace and be a breather of peace. To carry my breath is to know that I am in you and you are in me, for you are my body on the earth, and it is still my intent to grow you up into Christ, that you so breathe in and breathe out the knowledge of your sonship in me, the knowledge that you have died and your life is hidden with Christ and God, that when people look at you and say, show us the Father, you too have enough of my breath in you to say to this world, when you see us, you've seen the Father, for we are his children. When you touch us, you touch Christ, for our lives are in communion with his. Does that sound too extraordinary a thing to say? Perhaps you think that the only time you might be able to say such a thing would be in heaven one day after a lifetime of Christian service. What if I told you that the Apostle Paul led a life of such breathing in and breathing out the breath of God, of such knowing of God, precisely because knowing this wasn't where he finished. It was where he began. Paul began as Saul of Tarsus, persecuting the church, breathing in and breathing out hate, until one day on the road to Damascus, Jesus spoke to him and his words breathed into Saul a revelation that became the foundation of everything he taught. Jesus said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting 
me. And when Saul said, who are you, Lord? The answer he got was a revelation so bright his physical senses could not handle it. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Can you hear what Saul heard Jesus say? Touch the church and you're touching me. Church, in Christ, we are an entirely new creation. Our old life, that separated from God life, passed away and the Holy Spirit has been saying to the church for 2,000 years, behold, see, all things are new. But the Martha church has been so busy in the kitchen, continually trying to cook up something for God, that she has been missing out on what has been given to her, his presence. I think what Martha said to Jesus on that day is very significant because it revealed what was in her heart, what she was believing. She said in effect, Lord, I have been left to serve alone. Believer, church, before you begin crying out to God about being left alone, you may want to stop long enough to take a deep breath. For when you start to breathe in the knowledge that God's Spirit is breathing out, you will find that you have never been left alone. For you will have breathed in the peace of God, the irony, the being set at one. Believer, church, we were never left alone. It's just that we're short of breath. It's time to catch our breath, the breath of the communion of God. And as Jesus pointed out to Martha, we do that by doing exactly what Mary did. We take our seat with Christ, close enough to breathe in what he is breathing out, because this generation needs more than buildings full of people. They need people full of the breath of God. So let me breathe on you a declaration of truth. For if you're listening to this message today and it is witnessing with your soul, then the Lord is blessing you and keeping you. The Lord's face is shining on you and he is being gracious to you. The Lord's face is toward you and he is giving you his peace. He fills us with his peace that we may go out and breathe out his peace into this generation through the preaching of the gospel the message and the ministry of reconciliation. And as we are seen in this world to be his peacemakers, how blessed are such peacemakers, for they can only be called the children of God. God bless you.